This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a man telephoning an employment agency to register for job opportunities. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 7. Able Employment, how may I help you? I saw your advertisement in the Daily Gazette. Oh yes. And I'd like to register with you. I'm a student, but I've got the long holiday coming up. Certainly. I'll just get the form ready. OK, let me take your details. Sure. Can I have your full name? It's Bowen. James Bowen. B-O-W-E-N. Right. And your address, please? Well, just now I'm staying at the youth hostel. I see. But I'm moving into a flat on Friday. Well, give me that one, then. It's for Lion, like the animal, Road... Melford, MF4, 5JB. OK. And then I need to have a phone number for you. Uh, I don't know the number at the flat yet, but I could give you my mobile. That's 09954721822. Would that do? For the time being. But if you can let me know your new number when you can. Of course. Now, qualifications. What qualifications have you got? I mean, post-16 qualifications. Well, I stayed on at school till 18 and got my A-levels. Fine. Anything else? You said you were a student. Yes, and then I've done two years at college, so I've got my history diploma. Though I don't know how useful that'll be for getting a job. Well, it depends. Everything counts in some way. And I also did an IT course this year. And that got me my computer skills certificate, which I certainly hope is relevant. It's different anyway. Um, that's all, really. Hmm, that's quite a good range. And what about on the practical side? What work experience have you got? Well, not too much, because I've mainly been studying. Yes. But two summers ago, I worked just as general assistant in a hospital for about three months. It was quite hard, but very interesting. OK. Anything else? If you include part-time work... Oh, yes. I've often worked in the college holidays as a tour guide, showing visitors round. That's quite enjoyable, meeting people. I'm sure. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Hmm. Now on to interests. There's space here for two. What would you say? Two. Uh, well, I like various sports, but I suppose we should put that I'm in the swimming club. I'm pretty committed to that. Yes, that sounds good. And for the other one, something different? I'm very keen on music, too and I love playing piano. I've been doing that for over ten years now. 
Yes, I'll put that down. Well, that's more or less it for the time being. Uh、mm-hmm. huh. Just one more thing. What I do need is your availability. Oh yes. Um, the college term finishes on June the twentieth, and then I'm going to visit my parents. But I can be back and ready to start on June the twenty-eighth, if that seems okay. I'm sure it is. Now, what happens next is that I process this information, and then. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part two. You will hear a presentation from a ship's captain telling guests about what cruises are available. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Welcome to all our passengers. My name is Captain Gordon Peterson, and I'm one of the four captains here at NZ Dreaming Cruises. My purpose in the next few minutes is to give you an overview of what cruises are available for you to choose from. Once you have decided which one you'd like to go on, from this central area, we will board the boats for your individual cruises. I am assuming by now that you have read the brochures we sent to you. So I'll only take the time to mention the highlights of three of our cruises. Now we do have additional cruises on different days, but these are the three that we're offering passengers today. And、uh, please feel free to ask any questions you may have. Okay then, to begin, the Mitre Peak Lodge Cruise has consistently been one of the most popular cruises we offer. It's a two-day sightseeing spectacular. You will see the original homestead of Donald Sutherland, who arrived in the area in 1877. It's a real treat to see such an old building. Most people are not actually able to go in. However, included in the $170 price, we offer a tour of the old home. The lodge itself is now used solely as a part of the Milford Track guided walk and is not available for any other accommodation. We will arrive at the Mitre Peak Lodge and there spend the first night and next day before cruising home. The Milford Sound cruise is next. We used to operate this one daily from the wharf situated in Freshwater Basin, but recently we've upgraded the experience to a three-day, $240 voyage. Up until 1979, this area was also used as an anchorage for the Milford fishing fleet. We offer an opportunity to go fishing on this one. Don't worry if you don't know much about fishing. We also include a free fishing lesson with the cruise. You anglers won't want to miss this one. Our next cruise is more for the outdoor adventurer. We've called it Adventure Bound. This four-day trip starts with a visit to Lion Mountain, rising to a height of 1,302 meters, or 4,272 feet. You had better be sure to pack your climbing boots. Now, don't worry if you don't have any. Boots and basic outdoor survival skills are included in the $340 price. On day two, we go whitewater rafting, and if there's still snow on the mountain, we'll have a chance to go skiing. Before you listen to the rest of the presentation, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 17 to 20. Now just to let you know what is available as far as facilities are concerned. Our boats are fully equipped to offer you most of the comforts of home. However, a few things may be different. For example, showers. Please keep them to around a minute as we have limited heated water. There are no TVs on board, but you can listen to the radio to keep up to date with the outside world. You'll find that nature will provide most of the entertainment. Speaking of water, nature will provide a special surprise. As we cruise in close to the rock face of Fairy Falls, you'll be able to try your skill at catching a cup of the pure alpine water from the falls. Not everyone is successful at this, but over the years our staff have become very proficient at filling large containers full of this beautiful alpine water. There's always plenty in the kitchen for you to enjoy. And sorry, no swimming. We wouldn't want any of you to die from exposure. Meals. Meals are served at the same times. Breakfast is always from half past six in the morning and half past twelve for lunch. Dinner is served at six p.m. and we serve all meals for one hour. If you come after that, sorry, but you'll have to wait for the next scheduled meal. Our staff on board work very hard to prepare meals daily for your enjoyment. All we ask is that when you finish your meal, you take your time to wash any dishes you use and place them on the main counter. Our staff will put them in the kitchen and your cooperation here would greatly assist us in helping run the cruise. OK, that's enough from me. Let's board the boats. Have a great time. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a conversation between an undergraduate student, David, and his tutor, Dr Smith, about David's plans for doing a master's degree. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 26. Right. Well, David, I think it's a good idea to talk a little about your plans for going on to do an MA. Now, I understand you're thinking in terms of either Fourth College or Haynes College? That's right. Well, so far, anyway. No, I think that's a good choice to have narrowed it down to. I'm interested to know how the services to support students work in both places. Yes, I know you've needed to make use of those here in the last year. I have to say I'm not absolutely sure about the situation at Haynes. I expect they're all right, but certainly Fourth has a good reputation in that regard. They have a large number of students from abroad, and they have to make sure they're OK. That's reassuring. And then I'll be moving city again, obviously, whichever college I go to, and I hope that the room or flat I could expect would be nice. Very important, yes. These days, actually, all colleges tend to have decent quality rooms or flats for their students, and Forth and Haynes are no exception. Right. Well, what about comparisons on the academic side of things? Hmm, well, I know you're an avid user of the limited online provision we have here. I think you'll find Haynes is about as developed, <laughs> or not, as we are here, and that Forth has developed some pretty impressive stuff, which I'm sure you'd make the most of. Well, I'd certainly try. But that doesn't mean that the more traditional information sources, such as the good old-fashioned library, should be forgotten. No, of course not. While Forth has recently had a very splendid law library opened, that isn't particularly relevant for you. And I think you'd find Haynes' general university and faculty collections better suited to your needs. But that's something you could check for yourself if you visit both places. Which I'm planning to do next month. Good. Now, there's the question of the lecturing staff. 
which is clearly going to be key to your progress. I think you'd find them adequate at Forth. There are some solid people working there. Uh, while Haynes have recently taken on some inspirational people, very cutting edge. <laughs> it's a little hard to judge, though, because as a research student, it's not as if you have teaching all day, every day. No, I guess not. But I'll need to consult. Yes, and on the subject of research... In terms of the college's reputation for results, again, neither place is bad in any way, but I think you'll find, and you can check this on the Research Council's website, that Haynes has consistently scored very well. There's perhaps a little bit of an issue with non-completing doctorate students at Forth. Well, I'll certainly look at the website as you suggest. <laughs> Fine. Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions 27 to 30. I'm still a bit anxious about making this next step. I know the level of competition is very high, especially in my area. It makes me feel rather daunted. And I wonder if in a new place I may be out on my own, if you know what I mean, compared to the sense of community here. I suppose it'll be down to my determination to succeed to get me through. Hmm. Well, do remember how you felt when you arrived here. I'm sure you'll get on anywhere in the end. I hope so. And, of course, you still don't know exactly where you want to end up. By the time you've completed your Masters, you'll have a clearer idea of whether you want to progress to doctorate level. It's possible, I suppose, that you'll begin to see how much you might be interested in picking up some bits of lecturing earlier than that, since your area is fairly specialised and may put you in demand sooner than you think. To establish yourself in your area of expertise... It would be sensible to think in terms of getting your stuff into one or two of the journals, converting parts of your dissertation into suitable formats for them. That'll stand you in good stead, whatever else you decide to do. That sounds like good advice. Thanks. Actually, I think master's level studying has improved in some ways over the last few years. <laughs> the internet you love so much was always going to make all kinds of studying easier. Or that's the idea, anyway. <laughs> I'm not sure it really has the impact you might think. What I've found impressive is the way courses have developed to be more adaptable, more able to fit in with all the other demands in people's lives. So, while the exams and assignments you all have to do may not have shifted much, at least a wider range of students are now able to benefit from education at the higher levels. Mm. I just wish I could be sure I was always making the best use of my opportunities. At the end of each week, I usually feel I could have got more done, arranged things differently, been more efficient somehow. I've got a lot better at taking down notes during seminars and lectures, which means, I think, that my written work has benefited to some degree, so there's progress on some fronts at any rate. <laughs> yes, it's interesting See, That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear part of a lecture given at the beginning of a course in marine biology. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Students, I hope this first lecture which I've called The Uses of Oceanography will provide a helpful starting point for our studies this semester. In order to be a valid area of study, it has been said that the scientific study of sea or oceanography, as we call it, must point to the practical benefits that can be gained for humankind. There's no doubt many are the benefits which have been identified as a result of study in this field. Firstly, through careful study, oceanography helps us to determine where new raw materials for the future may come from, such as where new foods, for example, may be harvested. Certainly, to reap the harvest of the ocean is just as difficult as it is on land. Microscopic plants and animals or plankton are neither easy to gather nor edible for humans. Fortunately, our marine creatures do an excellent job at both gathering and eating, so we must continue to go out into the oceans and confront the often difficult oceanic conditions in an attempt to capture them for food. Of course, even in the most fertile areas, stocks of profitable and edible fish are not inexhaustible. In many areas around the world, limits are placed on numbers of fish that can be caught. Improving our understanding of marine species behaviour is therefore a dominant area of study for oceanographers. For hundreds of years, the ocean has been a cheap highway for commerce, but the challenge for those who travel it has always been to do so safely. Oceanographers therefore attempt to bring some predictability to the movement of currents, as well as the winds that blow and the effect these have on the waves that are generated. Early oceanographers such as Edward Forbes, a native of the Isle of Man and considered by many to be the founder of the science of oceanography, was the person to lay the foundation for British government's support of oceanography in the mid-19th century. Another of Forbes' contemporaries, Irishman J. Vaughan Thompson, collected and studied marine plankton off the Irish coast in 1828. In addition to marine life, Thompson's interests were in the tidal patterns and currents of the ocean. Another of the early professional naturalists that made significant contributions to marine biology was Charles Darwin. Darwin, most famous for his later works on theories of evolution, was commissioned early in life as a naturalist on HMS Beagle expeditions in the early 1800s. The Englishman collected and studied numerous marine organisms during this famous voyage, which eventually led to his subsidence theory of coral reef formation. According to this theory, fringing reefs form along the edges of an island and then, as the island subsides, a barrier reef is created. So we see that early oceanographers were interested in bringing predictability to the ebb and flow of the vast ocean. With industry pumping out more and more waste, another area in which oceanographers have busied themselves is in the use of the ocean as a means of waste disposal. In an attempt to discover a satisfactory answer to the question, the processes of diffusion and mixing, and the manner in which they depend on the waves, tides and currents, remains a focused area of study. Nuclear waste has also been an important area. Oceanographers are currently studying the effects of the burial of waste into the mud of remote ocean sites. The nuclear waste is packed into metal containers and transported via ship to a selected burial site. There is always debate concerning whether seabed disposal of radioactive waste is simply dumping today with little thought for tomorrow. As we cannot predict the future, this question is a difficult one to answer. Instead of merely burying the nuclear waste, other means of disposal must be explored. This situation provides a strong future challenge for oceanographers and ensures their need for many years to come. In next week's lecture, we'll continue with our study. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, 
you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.